Hi, I'm Jenny Bodley, and um, I'm here to talk to you about using Socratic questions in the discussion board. So I'm going to get rid of my video here and just show my presentation. I'm an embedded instruction librarian here at City University of Seattle, and I work with a diverse group of students across several programs um, and different levels, the bachelor and the master's level. And a large percentage of my instruction is in online in asynchronous discussion boards. And I've been doing this for over six years. And I just had a huge problem when I was doing this. In most of my discussion boards, I was spending a lot of time and energy writing follow-up posts and asking several questions, um, pointing out what was good or what needed work, giving additional information. And I was really just trying to construct conversation and model good academic habits. And when I went back and checked the discussion boards for responses to my thoughts and questions, I found brief, low effort responses like, those are great, I'll do that. Or, you know, sometimes it was just thanks. Uh, and then of course, some students had no responses. So I'd send class announcements asking for students to reply to my posts, but that really didn't fundamentally change what was happening. And being in this situation really impacted me. It was depressing. I'd invested so much and was getting so little back. The few good interactions I was having with students just weren't enough to sustain me over the quarters that I was teaching. I was feeling futility, um, confusion, lots of emotions, exhaustion, and to be honest, even a little anger at the students and the whole situation. So I'm wanting to know if that resonates with any of you. And you can just raise your hand or say yes in the comments. Um, and then also, if anybody wants to very, very quickly share an example where you poured your heart out to a student and it ended up feeling like it was a waste. <laughs> but I'm seeing a lot of hands, so that's great. Um, So I was in that situation and I needed to find something to get myself out of that situation. So um, I knew I needed to spend less time writing, all while trying to increase engagement. And I happened to come across two articles by Sherry Toledo about creating good questions for online discussion. Toledo specifically discussed the use of Socratic questioning in online discussion boards. And what Socratic questioning is, is it's a learner-centered approach that challenges a person to develop critical thinking skills and engage in analytic discussion, which then leads to independent learning and thinking. And that's what we're wanting all of our students to be able to do. This form of questioning can be used to create exploratory conversations that help students uncover assumptions and to analyze complex concepts. And so Socratic questioning can be used to help students connect content and process. And I really think that a lot of students struggle with this. A lot of students from the bachelor level all the way to the doctoral level. Um, Socratic questioning is done via five sets uh, or categories of probing questions that address clarification, assumptions, reasons and evidence, viewpoints or perspectives, and implications and consequences. And this is a slide that shows you those five categories and a couple of example questions that you might use. These Socratic questions probe for those kinds of, of things. And one of my favorite ones that posted on this slide is, um, how would you summarize in your own words the quote you posted? So that's asking a student to clarify. And I know a lot of students in discussion boards like to just kind of plop in a quote from some article or their textbook. And this helps them engage a little more deeply. So I do want you to, to know that um, sometimes this type of questioning may seem curt and confrontational. So these are kind of softened versions of Socratic questioning. They don't contain the words you or the phrases. And you use phrases like, I'm wondering, um, just to kind of soften the questions themselves. You know, I want students to feel safe sharing their thoughts and not be afraid to explore. So I don't want to be off-putting to them. I want to be welcoming and giving them a safe environment. These are really short, pointed questions that ask the student to go deeper in their thought processes. 
So I started implementing Socratic questioning. I kept my responses short and made every keystroke count. I made sure there was a lot of white space in my reply posts. And you know what, the, instruct, the results were really good. Um, student engagement seemed to increase and I spent a lot less time crafting longer responses. I even saw the students picking up on this questioning style and every once in a while I'd see them mirror the kinds of questions that I was asking them when they were engaging their peers and that just you know, was so great to see. So when I implement Socratic questioning, um, from reading about this, I, I found some recommendations. And I always include three things in my post to students. I address the student by name. I show uptake, which is the echoing of what the student has already posted. And um, I choose one thing that might relate to a probing question, and I ask that one probing question. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. This is the first example. And I'll let you read it. I'll read it out loud. Um, a student posted, I used, this is from a business course. I, I, maybe this is from uh, marketing, or I, I can't remember which course it was from. But I used Business Source Complete, one of our databases, and found the SWOT for Toyota, but cannot find any other useful information. I also searched the official website. Could you please recommend some resources for searching for Toyota's target customers, Toyota's positioning, price strategies, product strategies, etc. So my response follows. You can see it's very short. I actually bolded my question, which is something I now do. I used to not do it, but I think it's effective to bold your question and letting the student know that's your question that you're expecting a response from them about. And I said, hi, student. Just insert their name. Thank you for your post. The Toyota SWAT is a good start. Using the SWAT, the company website, and other resources will be about reading and inferring. And again, I'm kind of getting to that content and process piece just by that kind of comment. But this is also where I'm echoing what they've said. So they know I've read what they've written. I see on the SWAT you included that there is a threat to increased environmental regulations. And my question here is, how might an increase in environmental regulations affect Toyota's product strategies? Beth, Jenny. So I'm not giving them a lot. I picked one spot where I could ask a question and I was hoping to engage the student. I'm throwing it out and hoping that they bite and reply. And in replying, they're going deeper in their thinking. Um, I'm going to go back, keeping that example in mind. Does anybody else have an idea of a question? Um, Socratic question you might have used in that situation? I'm kind of putting everybody on the spot. I know this is kind of quick. Okay, and that's okay. Um, I also want you to know, just because that example was a business example, you can use this across all content areas. I teach information literacy. You can use it in whatever content area you're working in. Here's another example. Um, and this one's a little more specific to the content um, that I teach with information literacy. Here's a student post. A better article I found was neonictoids and bee die-off from Global Research and Mercola. Com. The source was unbiased and had convincing evidence. So this is a very short post from the student. It's quite general. Um, and I want them to go deeper. I want them to give me more. So that's what I'm keeping in mind as I'm reading this example and thinking about what my reply to be would be. And again, you can see my reply is quite short. Dear student, thank you for your post. Understand that you were trying to fact check by using an article written by Joseph Mercola from Mercola.com website. What might be some reasons to doubt that evidence and that source? Best, Jenny. So again, I highlighted my question. And um, again, with this example, I'm going to ask anybody if they 
have ideas on different kinds of questions I might ask in this situation. Uh, Jenny, I was going to note, um, not specific to this, but I use, uh, this is Brian Carter, um, I use the product. I'm not sure who's talking, but I actually can't hear you, Brian. I'm really sorry. Oh. How about now? Oh, there you go. Much better there for me. Go. I, I had it plugged in wrong. Um, so this is Brian from ASOE. Um, not specific to this particular discussion board, but I use Socratic questioning and Socratic seminars as kind of a core part of my teaching style going all the way back to when I was in public schools. And um, one of the methods that I use might be even a, a apply to the first discussion board question you listed is ranking. Um, you know, you have a list of items, 10 items, rank them from most important to least important. The one stipulation, though, with any sort of dis uh, Socratic discussion is um, if it's a back and forth between one person and another, that kind of actually deviates from the core of what a Socratic should be, which is the conversation among multiple people. Um, the questioning, not so much, but if you're having a Socratic discussion. Right, and I'm sure uh, any attorney that might be here would um, uh, certainly make the distinction between what I'm talking about and the Socratic process that they might use in a class with their class, bringing the class along with them on this learning journey to go deeper. Um, and Brian pointed out exactly um, what we're talking about is we're just using Socratic um, questions. Um, so the, and, and these are kind of just meant to get students to a next level. It's not getting you from A to Z. I'm just trying to get you from A to B. And I think in discussion boards where there's a lot of form formative um, learning and then formative assessment happening, getting from A to B, um, the discussion boards are a great place to get that incremental learning in. So thanks for your comment, Brian. Did anybody else have any um, ideas on questions you might ask for those situations? Okay. Well, I'd like to um, kind of gather what we've talked about and give you some final suggestions and thoughts in case this sounds interesting to you and you'd like to start using this type of uh, Socratic questioning in your own teaching and discussion boards. Um, I'd highly recommend reading Toledo's articles. I have them on the references on the last my at the end of my slide, so I definitely can add some um, hyperlinks. I didn't do that in here, but um, we have these in the library and you're welcome to read them. They're very accessible. Uh, they read almost like a, a workbook or a how-to manual, um, but they're, they're really great and um, they go into a little bit more background about why Toledo started using Socratic questioning and um, they're, they're both really, really great. I want you to know, word of caution, that this takes practice. Um, I've been teaching and using discussion boards for a while, and I've been able to craft some scripts over time. So um, what I find is that students, a lot of students have kind of similar responses in the discussion board sometimes, so I might use that same Socratic question for several students. Um, and of course, over the quarters, if you can make some scripts, you can uh, add them much more quickly. You can also address students generally with Socratic questions through announcements or through your own discussion board post. Um, and this really helps with time and scalability and that kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with my problem was just that I felt overwhelmed. I was putting a lot of time in and not getting a lot back. So this is going to help you with time and scalability. I want you to know you can also apply this to face-to-face -face situations. So for those of you who um, in addition to teaching online, teach face-to-face. -face. Uh, you certainly can do this in your classroom discussion. And again, it doesn't have to be this 
big Socratic, uh, you know, experience that you might have if you're in law school. This can be incremental, used for incremental learning, for guiding discussions. Um, so using it in a classroom discussion, you could use these as exit tickets. So when your students leave the room, before they leave the room, give them a piece of paper with the Socratic question you've chosen, and hopefully they can all respond to that and hand it in. And then you can do a little bit of formative assessment. Um, by reading their answers. And of course, there are lots of other formative activities and assessments that you could use this with. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with people about that. And I think um, the biggest lesson that I got out of having this problem of finding this solution was that you really have to have compassion for yourself um, as an educator. Um, as an online educator in particular, um, we put a lot of time and effort and energy into teaching. And um, if you are in a trough or a dark place or however you want to describe it, um, I want you to remember to have compassion for yourself. And I had a problem and I try to figure out a solution. And so um, talk to your peers, talk to the library, talk to um, other people in faculty development and um, you know maybe there's some way we can um, help with issues that you're having with your online learning. I'd love to, I'm stopping a little early, but I'd love to open up the floor to other questions and actually pause and read some questions on the side. I see that uh, Presley has a question. Could you show the question samples again? Yes, yes, I'm sorry if I missed that. Um, question earlier. Here's the slide. And again, there's about five categories in this um, way that we're talking about Socratic questioning, clarification, assumptions, reason, and evidence. I think maybe depending on what you're trying to teach, what level you're teaching, um, you might use some categories of Socratic questions more than others. Because I teach information literacy, I use a lot um, of questions that deal with assumptions, reasons and evidence, and viewpoints and perspectives. Um, so a lot of students will use an article, for example, and it's not very trustworthy. So I talk to them about reasons and evidence and ask them to look at the reasons and evidence that they're using and, and hopefully go deeper with those sources. I see that Elizabeth has pinned um, one of the articles. Thank you so much. So you can see that in your comments to the right. You can click on that Elizabeth put in there. I really appreciate you uploading that. And I again, I really encourage everybody to read it. And Mike Walker had a comment. Give me a second to read that. Socratic questioning is a cornerstone of effective teaching and learning. In addition to posting Socratic questions, a faculty can also direct to all forum participants or relate questions to aspects of another student's post. And that's great, Mike. That's exactly what I was talking about. And that goes back to my issue that I was having at the beginning. How do I preserve myself, set boundaries for myself, while still having quality in my instruction and encouraging engagement from students. So that's an excellent way to uh, send out questions to a bigger group um, or use one student's questions where you don't have time to answer everybody's, pick a couple people's questions, address them to the whole um, class. So that's great for time and scalability. Thanks for the comment, Brian. Um, Brian mentions, it's a matter of removing yourself as sage on the stage and focusing on facilitating learning through collaborative discussion. It's moving to the how and the why rather than the what and the when. Yes, and it's also, you know, your comment about being sage on the stage. Um, This really puts it back on them in a positive way um, and helps you be partners in the learning journey that they're on, but still making sure that they're the leaders, not you. They're the leaders in their own education. 
Um, Gundrun, thank you so much. Um, you'll ask more questions, great. And look at these articles to get more questions than what you see on this slide right here. Carolyn asks, have you noticed a difference in the way they interact with each other as well? Yes, Carolyn, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I did notice in some of my discussion boards where I consistently asked uh, these types of questions and what I saw when they were responding to their peer posts, as is often necessary where they have to reply to two peer posts, they would pick something out that their peer did and um, ask them a Socratic question. And it was, that was really great to see. One thing I also have done is give them examples. So in the discussion board, when I say, when I'm following up to peer posts, keep these kinds of questions in mind. And I give them some examples. So they might use some of those examples when questioning their peers or edit slightly those examples. Matt Lechner, very time efficient. Yes, yes. And again, that, that was one of my issues was being more efficient with my own teaching. And Brian Carter noticed that he also notices a difference in the way students interact with each other when he uh, uses Socratic questioning. That's great. Any other final thoughts from anybody or um, have questions about where they can look or comments about experiences? Yes, the PowerPoint slides should be posted. So Arnold is asking about PowerPoint slides. I actually missed quite a few presentations this morning, so I'm happen, happy to go back and listen to others. I'm very excited about it. So those will be posted. Um, faculty learning, Blackboard support, or e-learning will be sending out emails about how to, where to find this information, I'm sure. Great. Thank you so much, guys.